Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, we hope you enjoy this legal and gun educational content, and today will be the day we earn your subscription. We are here for Gun Talk Friday with our special guest, Stephanie. Say hello, Stephanie. Hello, everybody. Yes. And we will take your questions along the way. And we are going to be looking at and responding to a brief that was just filed with the U.S. Supreme Court in the ongoing NYSRPA case, New York State Pistol and Rifle Association versus Corlett. This particular brief was filed by the Black Attorneys of Legal Aid, the Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defender Services, and others as an amica curia. So it's a bunch of public defenders who take the indigent and the poor and they think gun rights are a good idea and they think that their clients have been deprived of gun rights and the second amendment has been a paper guarantee at least as far as new york is concerned for quite some time so we'll be responding to that in large part but we do have a super chat right at the chart start from nqs who gave us five dollars thank you for the super chat what is the best pistol design and why is it the CZ-75? Well, for me, I'm going to say the best pistol design is the Glock 17. And here are my reasons why. The Glock 17 was a, was a revolution. It has been the basis of many firearms that have come after it. Um, other firearms manufacturers have followed it, from Heckler & Koch to, to Beretta to to lots of different companies have, have tried to, to from m and Smith & Wesson, have used the Glock design as a basis for the firearm. It is a polymer-based frame. It has a metal slide and metal components, so it will last. And the polymer itself is very durable. And what's really nice about the Glock is two things. First, it has very few components. It has about half as many components as, for example, a Sig Sauer. So it only has about 38 components in it. So it's fewer things to go wrong. And it will reliably, like the AK-47, take any ammo in any condition, dirt, grime, whatever, and it will fire it and feed reliably. It's the reason that the Glock is the, the, the firearm of choice for about 70% of law enforcement agencies in the United States. It's it's reliable, durable, relatively cheap, will feed all ammo. It It's foolproof, safe, durable. It's fantastic. But, you would go with the gun that Tupperware built? Yes, but exactly. Stephanie has issues because of Tupperware. So tell me why I'm wrong. Because nobody needs the gun that Tupperware built. Just because there are less parts doesn't make it better. <laughs> We're going to go with uh, the classic, the 1911. The 1911 there's a reason, is... It, th there's a reason the 1911 has literally been done by everyone. The it 1911 is, is a fantastic firearm. It is a fantastic firearm. 45 caliber, 7 plus 1, reliable. It, it was does not made... have to be. Well, My no. My 1911 is 18 plus 1, double the traditional, 40. The traditional, original 1911. The I said my pair is a double stacked 45 1911. Okay, no. fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. You know, the 1911 is a fantastic firearm. It was invented, I believe, in 1907, formally adopted by the military in 1911, which is why it gets its name. It was adopted as a sidearm for the U.S. military until the Beretta came along in 19 mid 80s, I think. It was the official firearms uh, fire sidearm of the military for 75 years, give or take. It's a fantastic firearm. It's reliable, durable. It's it's brilliant in its design. Forty-five caliber. Um, you know, and if you're looking for one today, there's lots of different companies that make them. Lots of great companies. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the 1911. I don't poo-poo with the 1911. I think it's a fantastic firearm. <laughs> um, for me, though, I think the Glock has been more revolutionary than the 1911. I think that the Glock has had more derivatives based on it than the 1911. I think that pretty much all the, especially the single stack 9mm have been based on the nine, um, on the Glock. 
It has been a complete revolution for concealed carry, complete revolution for personal defense. It's it's reliable, cheap. It's what I use in my house. You know, you pull the trigger and it goes bang every time. What's not to love? It's the gun that Tupperware built what not to love. And I'll stick with the 1911. And it should not be a concealed carry issue because I can easily conceal my para, my last pair, all of my 1911s without much problem in like yoga pants. You just have to know how to do it right. The yoga and pants yes. might be a slight challenge. No, it, it, it's not. And uh, Garrett, yes, God bless uh, his holiness, John Moses Browning. You know, at least we have one uncivilian that's got, you know, the taste in it. And uh, Curtis Jones, yeah, sometimes you have that with some of the paras. Usually it's a feed ramp and an extractor issue if you tune it. Yeah. Usually solves that problem pretty quickly. I, the, I'm all about it. I'm all about the, the 45 ACP. The nine, the nine millimeter, though, cannot be disputed. It's called the nine millimeter nine millimeter parabellum if you seek peace prepare for war i mean that's pretty badass the german luger fantastic in firearm 15, in 15 years of trauma i've never had a patient where i'm like hey you have a medical history of being shot nine times what were you shot with it went a 45 no they're always like oh yeah i was shot with a nine generally if you were shot nine times with a 45 you're not like oh yeah i survived i'm fine <laughs> There's wonderful high quality ammunition these days on my millimeter. It's not just ammunition. It's a little bit on ammunition. You know how to use it. Well, you point the business end at the bad guy and pull the trigger. Yes? We can debate this, but I mean, many people like to fire it like they pulled it out of the box, still sideways without using the sights. Using the so sights you, would you, be you important, although it depends what distance we're talking about. If we're talking about standard self-defense distance, then, yeah, the sights are probably not really required. You just cover them with the front sights and you'll probably be fine. You don't really need the back sight. Just the front sight will be fine. Yeah, I'm still going to go with a 45 or a 40. I'm not a 9 millimeter kind of girl. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. And we all know my love of very large caliber rifles, so... Yes, you know, you have the 50 caliber Barretts, you have large firearm sniper rifles you are definitely a badass to be no I, I just like big girl guns not like little kid guns i do have the desert eagle and 50 ae but that's obnoxious <laughs> it's a little much yeah it's a little much <laughs> cobra kai gives the five dollars to say the m1911 is still used by the military today truth in that truth in that primarily by drill and ceremony units and military competitive shooting units and some marine units yes the 1911 is still in production today it's still in use today it's still in still it's a still a well-loved fireman for well-loved reasons and um you know if you want to go away from the nine millimeter you know it's one of the reasons the fbi came up with the 40 caliber the the neck down 10 millimeter was why the 40 caliber was invented a classic of the fbi um 45 caliber has a lot of advantages too it's a slower moving around but it's bigger obviously and when you get that the, the uh, you know the the hollow point ammo and it flushes out usually goes about twice the size so you're talking about you know nine tenths of an inch give or take of penetration you know it's notable so yeah but you also have to take into account if we're going to discuss things like ammunition hollow point ammunition you have to be very careful because depending on what you're shooting into it'll prevent expansion that's why a lot of them now have a little bit of wax because otherwise mm -hmm. it can't mm -hmm. prevent the expansion of it mm -hmm. and i see han saying that you know buying his first gun for protection if it's your first gun for protection in the home i would go with the shotgun with rifle slugs in all honesty um if it's going to be your first gun on the street it's whatever you can shoot reliably i think it whatever you're comfortable sh lock, whatever uh, you're comfortable whatever you're comfortable shooting is the primary consideration because it's it's well said that a 22 that you use is better than a 45 you won't use so right. whatever you have to you have to fundamentally at its core be comfortable with the firearm be able to train with the firearm be able to use the firearm and for some people, that might not be a 45, and that's okay. And if you want a 38, or you even like want a 25, if that's what you're comfortable shooting, God bless you. Because first of all, you have a right to protect yourself. 
and 25 is better than nothing. And it's certainly better than a 45 that you're not going to train with. You don't want the first time you're going to pick the 45 up to be the time you need it. Well, okay. We're going to pause on that one because that's like one of my big pet misnomers. Mis mis it is not the caliber of the ammunition that decides the recoil. And I have taught hundreds of people to shoot and taught hundreds of self-defense classes. And many people have a harder time with a nine in the recoil because they've got something like a Glock that's a lighter pistol. Yes. With slightly lighter recoil springs, so they feel it more, or depending yes. on how it fits your hand. I know plenty of tiny females that prefer a 40 in a slightly heavier older Ruger P91, P89 sure. frame and they don't have the recoil issue you do with a nine it's whatever you're going to use but don't get swept into oh it's a nine it's going to kick less no there are nines that i would not want to fire one-handed and i'll take a 50 ae and fire it one-handed any day absolutely so that's gun dependent not caliber dependent well it's a little bit of both but you're absolutely right garrett jackson gives us two dollars to say remember kurt that b and 50 bmg is for browning we can't ever forget but to stephanie's point <laughs> Yeah, if the weight of the I don't gun... need more sun, I'm always this pale. Well, I'm always this pale, too. We're both pale. Yeah, we're both pale. Um, to Stephanie's point, the lighter the firearm is, the more felt recoil there's going to be because there's less mass to deal with the recoil. You know, it's an issue of Newton's laws, right? Force equals force. So the force of the bullet coming out must necessarily, inevitably, be counteract by the force coming back and the, the heavier the firearm is the more mass there is so the harder it is to move it right that's another one of Newton's laws of motion is that an object in rest will tend to stay in rest so as that bullet is moving out and pushing back from the the um gas the hot the the larger or apologize the more mass the firearm has it's not an issue of largeness it's an issue of mass the, the more mass the firearm has, the smaller the felt recoil will be. And this comes into trade-offs and what you need to consider for various purposes. You know, the, the, the standard advice for concealed carry, at least for me, and you may differ on this, and this will be an interesting aspect because we're both NRA certified. So it'll be an interesting aspect if we differ, differ on this. Um, but the standard advice for me would be you want a firearm that's thin, and lightweight it doesn't matter how long it is but thinner and lighter is better that will tend to be the stuff that you carry the thinner it is the less profile it would have the lighter it is to carry the less it will drag down your clothing the more imperceptible it will be now stephanie's right that comes with trade-offs and as you're considering the fire the ammo that's coming out of it you have to practice with it either way if you just want it strictly for home defense then yeah, weight isn't much a factor. Then go with a 1911. It's a heavier gun. It'll be a lot easier to deal with in a, a concealed care, in a home defense situation. Um, but yeah, th these are standard considerations. There's trade-offs uh, on what you're trying to do in terms of your purpose. What do you think, Stephanie? I mean, well, first, Han, I'm not sure exactly what state you're in, but the majority of states do have ranges that'll let you rent different guns for an hour so you can cycle through and, you know, Preach. see what you like. But I personally think a lot of it also has to do with your hand size when it comes to kick carrying guns. Preach. Um, I, I'm not much, for one, for saying, oh, girls need this gun, girls need that gun, because generally I'm good with anything. But I can say that women don't carry the majority of the mass in their shoulders. So women tend to feel recoil differently than guys do. And women's hands are different sizes. I know a lot of men who feel some of the nine millimeters end too high up on the palm. Mm -hmm. And so they pull. You have to look when you're shooting and you start looking at the nuance of where your shots are going. Are you pulling? Are you limp wristing? Are you anticipating your recoil? And take all of that into account. Um, you also need to take into account how you're going to carry and what your primary method of carry is going to be. Are you going to IWB? Are you going to carry a shoulder rig? I carry a shoulder rig a lot of the time um, under a sweatshirt or a jacket, and I carry it the small of my back a lot of the time. But what you have to remember is you have to be comfortable with it. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be cleaned, and you need to be able to do it in your sleep. 
the mm. reality is it doesn't matter if I can in competition knock them down every time at a thousand yards with my rifle when my you know adrenaline's going and that, that gun's moving what what am I going to be shooting like what's my pattern going to be so you need yeah. to really dial into what you're most comfortable with and what some people don't always take into account is yes safeties are a good thing to have but what is the safety on the gun my Ruger has no safety and I like it because Either does my Glock. Night, I don't have to worry about a thumb safety yeah. or a grip safety or did I depress multiple safeties accidentally put one I pull the trigger it goes bang so you also need to take that into account are you going to under stress remember to take your safety off yeah you know uh the glocks don't have safeties external safeties i should say they have three internal safeties um but they don't have external safeties and i and a lot of 1911s do have external safeties um so that's something you have to consider uh, what in terms of how you're carrying but stephanie is completely right um you need to you need to have familiarity with your firearm. You need to be putting a couple hundred rounds down this firearm on a monthly basis to have familiarity with it. Because when the moment of truth comes, everything's going to go completely to shit. And all that's going to really exist is muscle memory at best. So, you don't want to, you know, be in the moment of crisis with a firearm that you just keep in a safe for emergencies it's probably not going to end as well as it could. So much better is, as I was saying before, if, 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 it, if at the end of the day, the only firearm that you're comfortable with is a 22, then carry a 22. It's still better than nothing. If it's what you're going to practice with and what you're going to use, you can use it. You can be effective with the 22. It's not the best. It's not the most ideal. It's not what I'd recommend necessarily. But at the end of the day, that's what you are comfortable with. And it's what you're comfortable with. It's better than a 45 you'll never practice with. You know, you want to practice on your draw. You want to practice on your aiming. You want to practice under some stress. One of the reasons I like, for example, USPSA, United States Pistols Association, is because you can practice under some stress. You know, you have to shoot on the move. You know, when you're practicing, you're shooting from position to position moving running so you're getting some adrenaline in your body it's something um but it's something you want to practice with take some training with get some familiarity with and whether it's a shotgun or a rifle or a pistol you want to have familiarity with it so you have some idea of what you're doing i do like the 10 millimeters uh, i i see you i see my 10 millimeter people but i i will also say you know i think it was blaine that brought it up only care if you're ready to use it. Not only only care if you're ready to use it, don't pull it out unless you're ready to kill somebody. Only point it at something you want dead. It's We're one of the basic firearms rules. People. We're not here to deter people. We're not here to scare people. We're not here to wound people. If I've pulled it out, one of us isn't going home, and it's probably not going to be me that doesn't go home. Um, right. So it's, the one the, it's one of the basic firearms rules of safety, right? It's one, something every NRA instructor is instructed on. The firearm is always loaded. Don't aim the firearm at anything you don't intend to destroy. Be aware of your target and what is behind it. Like, those are the basic firearms rules. If you follow those rules, you'll be... Yeah, you should not draw your firearm unless you're going to shoot. You shouldn't fire this warning shot crap. I don't know where some of the Democrats and Joe Biden with my wife can fire a shotgun up into the air. Like, where this bullshit came from? This, first of all, that's probably illegal in a lot of states, to be quite honest. If you're not, if you're firing a firearm and you're firing it up in the air, well, you must not have been that threatened. It's negligent, dis negligent discharge. Yeah, generally. and you have to be aware of where that bullet is going to fire yeah, or where that bullet is going to land. So you have potential liability all over the place. You shouldn't be doing that. You should only pull out a firearm if you're prepared to use it. And, and you should and use it if, you're, if, you're health, if, you're, if your safety is in threat. And Han, you should, if you're going to open carry, you are going to open yourself to a whole lot of drama generally. Um, you don't want to print, which is when you can see it through clothing, because again, a whole lot of drama. It's not a deterrent as much as people think. If you are printing or open carrying, you're my first target. If I'm the bad guy, 
because then you can't fix things. And I'm probably going to take your gun from you and use it on you. So mm -hmm. I would advise that we don't print and that we don't open carry and that we are very sure of ourselves. because if you're trying to deter somebody with it, yeah, I, I share this advice generally. There, there has been a bit of debate in the gun community about open carry versus a concealed carry. And I share Stephanie's opinion on this issue. Uh, I'm of the opinion that open carry presents more downsides than any upside it might present. The reason to open carry, the only, the only situation in which I've ever open carry was explicitly to make a political message. For example, when I was in Virginia for many, many years, uh, the VCDL, Virginia Citizens Defense League, went down on Martin Luther King Day because it's a federal holiday, but it's not a, a holiday in Virginia. It wasn't at the time, at least. So the state legislature was meet every Martin Luther King Day. And it was the second week of the, week of the session because the way Virginia works is they only work on a part-time basis. So they only work for part of the year. So they start their session the week before. So Martin Luther King Day is a really nice time because it's like the second week of the session. So I would go and open carry as I went down and up, up and down my the buildings to meet with the various legislatures for various constituents because I was trying to make a political point. And that was fine. But other than that, I would conceal carry all the time. I don't think there's any purpose in open carry, in my opinion. It exposes you as a target. It shows someone where a firearm can be reached. And if you get into a fight with a firearm, you don't want to be in that position. I think concealed carry is the way to go if you have the option. Yeah, I will open carry in some situations. Pennsylvania is fairly liberal with things like open carry in most places. But um, generally, if I'm quote unquote open carrying, it's a shoulder rig under a jacket that'll flap open. Or if I move and somebody sees it, I'm not. I, I don't like making a, a scene because the thing is, you mm -hmm. have to remember a lot of places people will push back. And if you're on private property, they have every right to say you can't carry here. Now, you run in, depending on the state, into the legality of it, and can I, I can carry there, it's my right, right, but if it's private property and they tell you to leave, you have to, or it's gonna be a, a trespass. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, level three holsters are a thing, SERPA is a thing, it, it's not foolproof. Nothing yeah. is. Yeah, there's there's nothing foolproof. I mean, most most uh, most uh, holsters are level two, if that, um, or even level one. Uh, in terms of in in, question, in case you're wondering, the levels determine determine how much like external resistance there is. So, like a level zero holster would just be based on friction, right? So there's nothing holding the firearm in place other than friction. A level one holster would be based on, you know, pushing a tag. So for example, so yeah, there are options to open carry, but still you're making yourself a target. If you wind up on the ground, if you know anything about martial arts at all, you know, ground fights tend not to end well. Uh, they're very dangerous in and of themselves. And, you know, if you get sucker punched, everything you've been training for and thinking of in your mind is gonna go completely out the window. So is not my recommendation well kurt apparently um we are cowards currently so our our, our weak talking point about you know well the chat can guns... fuck off i'm giving my opinion yeah yeah I'm, i wasn't really worried about you telling someone to fuck off that, that that's cool um no I, i'm not scared to open carry nor am i scared to take a life uh, at all and if you're that concerned about people asking questions and getting answers because you don't like the talking point that the other people asked about, you probably aren't going to come up to me in real life and say anything to my face. So yeah, I mean, I see out from behind the camera. Let, let's, let's, let's make this plain. I don't think any question is stupid. I will give you an honest opinion about any question you ask. I will give you my best opinion and I will ask my guest for her opinion. We're both NRA certified instructors. For pistol, she has more certifications than I do, incidentally. I'm just basic pistol instructor and something like uh, basic home, whatever, introductory pistol, and there's like one more I'm certified for. She has some rifle certifications I don't have. So I will ask, I will give you my opinion, and then I'll ask Stephanie for her opinion. I don't think any question is stupid. 
if then you come back with, well, that opinion sucks, my my response is, well, you know, go F yourself. I gave you my honest opinion, so take it or leave it. I don't know what you want from me. I'm not going to change my opinion just because, well, you're a coward. Blah, blah, blah. You know, that's not going to fly. <laughs> I'm not unable to be aware of my surroundings because I'm open carrying. Not at all. I'm more aware of my surroundings if I'm open carrying. But again, um, I would be more concerned about the people that you don't know that are carrying. We're generally the ones that are a little more dangerous. Okay, I, I don't have, have to compensate for anything. We have a super I, chat I really from Cobra so. Kai. Cobra Kai gives me $5. This is important. If you defend yourself with a gun and shoot the wound in Florida, can you get charged with Mamie? UL, what is your take? Well, yes. <laughs> yes, is the short answer to the question. The reason, all right, let's go for self defense law 101. And this will carry in Florida just as much as anywhere else. You can use lethal force in response to lethal force. If someone is posing an imminent threat of death or grievous bodily injury, you can use lethal force in response. If you are shooting to wound, it implies in some respect that the threat you're facing is not lethal. Because if it were lethal, wouldn't you defend yourself with your life? Why would you be shooting to wound? This doesn't make any sense. So from a legal perspective, it doesn't make sense. From a tactical perspective, it doesn't make sense. One of the reasons you want to shoot for center mass is because it's the biggest thing. And as anyone who knows anything about firearms and stress will know, your accuracy <laughs> goes to shit. I, I remember once where um, I remember once where I read an article where there was a there was a mass shooting in New York City. You know the mass this mass these mass shootings, and it turned out after the fact that it was the police chasing the suspect. They they shot at the suspect twenty two times. Guess how many times they hit. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah. So your your accuracy goes completely as shit. Um so aiming to maim is not a good idea. You aim for center mass because it's the biggest thing. It's also where the vital targets are. It's also because your threat your the only reason you're shooting is because your life is on the line. So if you're deliberately shooting to maim, your case is not as good as it could have been. Really, you should only be shooting why are you shooting if your if your life isn't on the line? And if your life is on the line, why aren't you shooting? To st not necessarily to kill, that's the wrong phrase, and I apologize for saying that earlier. Shooting to stop the threat. Shooting to kill is the wrong phrase. Shooting to stop the threat is the correct phrase. You shoot to stop the threat. And once the threat is stopped, you stop shooting. So that's the right answer. Greg he Polanski to... asks, is Stephanie single? Fuck no. Fuck you. <laughs> Oh my, oh my. But uh, yeah, it, castle doctrine, no duty to retreat. Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't help you. Wounding is not. It's not going to help you with the castle doctrine, a whole lot. It, I've seen people be sued because they shot somebody, wounded them, and then the person went and shot the homeowner's whose house. They they sued the homeowner when they broke into the house and got shot. So, people are stupid. But the reality is, I'm not a vampire. I'm just very pale. Thank you very much. No, um, don't shoot to wound. Just Mozambique to the chest. One of the, we've got this. Do the box Drilling drill, right? Two in the ended. chest. Yeah, do the box drill. Two in the chest, one in the head, one in the head, two in the chest. It's the standard box drill. If you're the if Mozambique. you're training, yeah, Mozambique. Okay, I know it is the box drill, so I, I I didn't know it was Mozambique, but fair enough. Yeah, so the standard box drill when you're when you're training is you have two targets, or, or the way I trained is anyway. So you do two in the chest, one in the head, one in the head, two in the chest, and just keep cycling. It's called a box drill or Mozambique. Yeah, so no, that's the standard. The Mozambique training. is two to the chest, one to the head, and that was because when the military was encountering people that were high in Mozambique, one shot wasn't dropping them. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Since you're talking NRA certifications, do I uh, do I call out for my friend in Northern California who's one and does C A N U T concealed carry training? Sure, knock yourself out. But yeah, you should get training from someone. Um, I've only done it for friends. I've done it for cost. Um, I did just to get more training and more certification for myself. But you know, it's. 
it's something you want to be familiar with and there's a lot of great options you know one of the great things about firearms today is maybe in the last maybe more than 10 years maybe a little bit longer than that or the last 10 years uh, especially is there's so many great you know thinner single stack nine millimeters and so many great choices look at glock look at smith and wesson look at uh springfield arms they do a great job look at m and p yeah the they do a great XD job is really nice the springfield xd is really nice uh ruger with the xds i think they changed that and they no longer sell the xds but the ruger xds was really really nice um, there's a lot of really great choices out there. So you got to find something that works for you. Yeah. I mean, Cobra, I love Colt too. And I do have an original Colt. The 1911 platform is my love though. I generally carry a less bare version of it. So I don't have the reliability issues, but it's not really an accessible thing for many people at this point. Absolutely. Well, let's so look a little. Amicus. Let's go. Yeah, let's let's look a little bit at this amicus because I thought this was really really interesting from the perspective. So I I should start by noting that I think there's been 42, maybe 43, <laughs> amici because I couldn't tell if this was the 43rd or not. That's the reason I'm not sure, um, because it wasn't on the Supreme Court's official docket that I saw. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But there's been 43 amici so far. The vast majority for people who are pro gun. So I, I forget exactly how many were in Heller and McDonald, but we're getting into that kind of territory. So this might be one of the most well-briefed cases of all time at the U.S. Supreme Court. So in terms of people looking at concealed carry and or, or permitted carry, to put it more properly, because that's really the issue, permitted carry, not necessarily the concealed carry. The XDS is Springfield. Yeah, the XDS is Springfield, right? Oh, no, wait. Then the Ruger. What's the Ruger then? Uh, the LDS or? Yeah, but I have a Ruger P91 and P89. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, the LCR, like uh, the LCR. LCRs. LCR, yeah, there LC9, not, there something like that. Yeah, the XDS and all XDs are Springfield Armory. That's right. Okay, so I made a slight mistake. I apologize uh, for getting the nomenclature wrong. That's uh, always a, a sin, so we try to get it right. I apologize. Um, but yeah, this brief in particular was filed by public defenders. So these are people who are defending the indigent, the poor. You know, the people who you have a right to an attorney, these people, right? And so we see it's the brief of the Black Attorneys of Legal Aid, the Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defense Services, as Emma Kakuri in support of the petitioners. They're pro-gun. So their basic thesis is we represent these people day in, day out, year after year, we care about these people and they're being hosed by your gun control. So, yeah, that's a lot of hilarity. <laughs> I'll read you some of this because it's just it's just really good. And, it, you know, it reads like an amicus brief because you wouldn't expect anything less, of course. Well, the lovely Miss, he the, the lovely Hedinger, uh, there, there will be no insulting because they are no longer able to appear. I've already taken care of that. So they, they earned themselves the door because I'm not as nice as uncivil. You all know that. He's much nicer and much more tolerant than me. Apparently, I'm a Romanian vampire, too. That's all right. The incorporated Second Amendment, and that's proper these days, thanks to uh, McDonald versus Chicago, right? It's been incorporated. Affords the people the right to keep and bear arms. Despite this clear text and the court's precedence, the New York licensing scheme does the opposite. It deprives everyone of that right, only returning it to a select few who managed to first secure a firearms license from the police. These people are on it. For everyone else, possession of a firearm is effectively a violent felony, punishable by three and a half to 15 years in prison. New York licensing requirements criminalize the exercise of the fundamental Second Amendment right with rare exception. As a result, every year we represent hundreds of indigent people who New York criminally charges for exercising their right to keep and bear arms. For our clients, New York's licensing regime renders the Second Amendment a legal fiction. We are definitely going for the throat on this one. 
No hold bars. We are very serious. Worse, virtually all of our clients who New York prosecutors prosecute for exercising their Second Amendment right are black or Hispanic. And that is no accident. New York enacted its firearms licensing requirement to criminalize gun ownership by racial and ethnic minorities. That remains the effect of its enforcement policies today. So, yeah, we're, we're going right for the throat here in every possible way. We're saying that, yeah, we represent these people, the forgotten people, the people that need the public defenders. And we, the black attorneys of the defense bar, represent these people who are getting three and a half years minimum because the Second Amendment is a fiction and it was created for racism based reasons. That's a lot of fun, man. Can we have a poll on like if people figure out where I'm actually from? Because I'm kind of enjoying the speculation. <laughs> well, I have to give them options. It's a poll. Whatever. I'm just enjoying the speculation <laughs> on Romanian vampire Latin. Well, she's mine, Romanian vampire, so you can all bug her off, man. Yeah, I got I got first dibs. But anyways, back to the stream. What do you think about this? I mean, I I, I love the language here. And we, we can even read some more language because it, it just continues to get even more interesting. It's it's just even more that great. The consequences for our clients are brutal. New York police have stopped, questioned, and frisked our clients on the streets. They've invaded our clients' homes with guns drawn, terrifying them, their families, and their children. Reminder, we are saying this to the U.S. Supreme Court. So, you know, we, we're, we don't give a F. They have forcibly removed our clients from their homes and communities and abandoned them in dirty and violent jails and prisons for days, weeks, months, and years. They've deprived our children of their job, our clients of their jobs, children and livelihoods, and the ability to live in this country. And they have branded our clients as criminals and violent felons for life. They have done all this only because our clients exercised a constitutional right. So, yeah, we, uh, we have some thoughts we'd like to share with the U.S. Supreme Court about, you know, how you're fucking over our clients, the indigent, the poor. We see a lot of black and Hispanics being charged with this stuff all the time, three and a half to four, 15 years. You know, it seems to be for racism that this, this law was created and incidentally was created in most of the states, right? You want to know. If you look at the maps, you know, like pre-1996 in terms of concealed carry, all the southern states were no concealed carry. Why might that be? Why were the southern states no concealed carry? I don't know. Well, it's actually racism, right? It's it's You can see it in the history. You can see it in the debates. We want to keep the arms out of the blacks. You see it in Crushank, for that matter. We cover that on my channel, right? That's 1875-ish uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Crushank dealt with Second Amendment, and the Supreme Court basically said overtly, well, you know, we can't have that Second Amendment right for the, all those emancipated black people. That's that, That's not going to apply. So let's nuke the entire Bill of Rights, you know, so we don't have to come to that conclusion. But yeah. Just just skip those. It's okay. They're, they're not important. You don't need those. You don't need those? No, you don't need those bills. We're just like, let's just push this over here. We don't, those amendments, we're, we're good. We don't want to use them. I thought they might because... be important. Well, I mean, it is to us, but the people saying like, hey, you know, we, we, we don't want minorities to have the firearms. Just, just, just over there. Just don't worry about it. Yeah, no. <laughs> I see there's some questions for second dibs in the channel. I will ban okay. your ass. I will ban all of you. No. If we're fine. I know. I know. I understand that. All right. Let's see. So let's look a little bit more at this brief. Because I just love the language. I love I love the aggression in it. You know, I, I, there's nothing that's exactly wrong with it. It's, I don't know, it's, for me, it's slightly, 
slightly more aggressive than I would have expected at the U.S. Supreme Court. So basically, I'm interpreting this as these people are pissed. <laughs> They're pissed. <laughs> New York violates our clients' rights to keep and bear arms by arresting, jailing, and prosecuting them for possessing firearms anywhere unless they've applied to and survived the state's expensive and onerous discretionary licensing process. The New York appellate courts believe the structure to be constitutional, notwithstanding Heller and McDonald. Yeah, this has been a problem of the appellate courts in general, uh, you know, writ large. Now, there have been some exceptions, even from unexpected places. We've seen some unexpected places from the Ninth Circuit, including from occasion from the Court of Appeals, although those have been reversed on bonk. Right in the in the Hawaii case, we saw the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals say the right to keep and bear arms was important, and then it went up to en banc to say no, not so much, not so important. And we of course see Judge Benitez, our favorite saint, patron saint of the right to keep and bear arms, with his opinion, where you know he says that more people have died from COVID than illegal firearms, which is hilarious. You know, he's not holding any quarter either. So, And we do see some other decisions occasionally from other courts of appeal and even occasionally from the U.S. Supreme Court. There was a little known opinion which upheld the right of people to have stun guns. I think it was Connecticut, one of the northeastern states. You know, it was done in a slip opinion um, that was little known about mm, five years ago, give or take. But yeah, we've seen some we've seen some light at the end of the tunnel. And now the US Supreme Court is considering the New York State and Pistol Rifle Association, where the question presented is dealing with whether or not the licensing regime for possessing a firearm is proper. And so in the Supreme Court could go a lot of directions with that, but you know, I'm optimistic. We can hope. We can hope, you know, it's, it's a little bit frustrating and I've expressed this frustration many times, but the Supreme court takes fairly reliably one, two, three, four, five first amendment cases on any given year. We had a fairly major one this year with BL versus Mahoney school district, the cheerleader case, right? Fuck cheer, fuck life, fuck everything. Fantastic. We have a right to say that. Screw you, school. You can't you can't discipline us. Um, I would have liked a slightly tighter opinion from the U.S. Supreme Court, maybe not leaving quite as many, you know, little off branches for the the uh, the school districts, leaving them a little bit of hope. I would like something a little bit more sharper, but it still was overall a good decision, even if I would have preferred something a little bit more. I just want Benitez to write everything that has to do with 2A. <laughs> yeah. I just, we and we've, Benito. we've seen opinions from four circuit courts of appeal where the judges, at least we've seen, we've seen lots of stuff. The courts of appeal have generally been saying, you know, intermediate scrutiny, it's just intermediate scrutiny. You know, it's, it becomes a mantra, you know, this is an important governmental interest. This is a release restricted means, important governmental interest. This is least restricted means. Or in governmental interest and least restricted means. Just as a mantra over and over again with not really any analysis. It becomes more than a little annoying. And then every once in a while someone pops up and says, hey, wait a second. Maybe the Second Amendment is a thing. Ooh. Maybe it deserves something that might be parallel to, for example, the First Amendment. And this is how I think about it. And you know, I've seen courts say that they're doing this, but I don't think they are, right? Because I can, you know, give me a half hour or so, maybe a little bit longer, I can kind of go through the First Amendment analysis as it's been developed over 80 years, you know? We can go through tiers of scrutiny, we can go through examples, we can go through major cases. I got the First Amendment analysis pretty well down. Um, and I think to myself, all right, we have a Second Amendment, which to my mind at least has very similar language to the First Amendment, and so I say, okay, can we map the Second Amendment, you know, at least, you know, for the most part on the First Amendment analysis? So we have some things that would be, you know, per se unconstitutional, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, rational basis. You know, we can have all kinds of things all over the place. So we can talk about proper restrictions in the, in the Second Amendment domain the same way we talk about in the First Amendment domain. And I say to myself, like, 
okay, well, we take, you know, three to five cases any given year on the First Amendment. Why aren't we taking three to five cases on the Second Amendment? And it needs a little love. We could develop this. We could, you know, could flush out these categories a little bit so we have some benchmarks to work from rather than just dealing with Heller and McDonald. I mean, they were great, but, you know, we could use something because else. It's been, uh, feelings. it's been it's feelings. Hurting feelings. You can't hurt snowflake feelings. The Second Amendment. Well, these days, they, they these, day, these days, snowflake feelings are being hurt by the First Amendment because they don't like the fact that, you know, everyone has the right to speak. And they don't like that people can back up their speech with their second. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's text of the Constitution. It presumably means something. It presumably has boundaries, like the First Amendment. And we could get into intelligent discussions, going through history, and doing historical analysis about what the right to keep and bear arms means, with the word the being emphasized, talking about the pre-existing right. So we could go to the history and go to the English common law and go to the things the founders were talking about and say, okay, what things might be outside of the right to keep and bear arms? What things were known to have, what kind of restrictions? What can we parallel against? How can we look to this history to inform our discussion? Of course, that would inevitably, at the end, lead to way more Second Amendment rights than the anti-guns one. It may not be everything the pro-guns people want, you know, to be quite fair. Um, you know, some of the Second this is a slight frustration of mine on the pro-gun side. Now, sometimes the pro-gun side will look at and they'll say, well, shall not be infringed. And, uh, no one's, no. and I'm like, well, the First Amendment says, you know, shall make no law. And we know from historical analysis and 80 years of case law what that means. So if you're if you're if you're ending and beginning is shall not be infringed, I'm like, I don't have time to deal with you. It's it's not quite that simple. Not for least the reasons that the thing that shall not be infringed is the right to keep and bear arms, which again has its own contours. So we have to have an intelligent discussion about what that means in a sophisticated way. So I have my issues with the pro gun side too. They are a little simplistic sometimes. Thoughts, commentary, disagreement. I think people like to uh, try to go with the shock value on it. My rights shall not be infringed, just like the idiot YouTuber who decided that while he was safe in his own home, I'm going to open a door and start firing a gun in the air because I'm scared for the person on the other side of the door. I Okay, like we've taken it a little far at this point with the hurt feelings in mom's basement. So I think the problem is a lot of the pro-gun gets wrapped up in, you look ridiculous. Um, you, you're looking ridiculous if you're like, I'm going to open carry three ARs, you know, four pistols, and because I can and I'm Rambo. So you just discredit yeah. things. Just <laughs> Some of these people, some of these people that are pro-gun are not helping. Yeah, they're not helping. I, no, I remember. And that's uh, the problem. I remember when Alan Gura, who argued for Heller and McDonald, you know, good attorney, competent. He won the case. And I remember because I went to a couple meetings with uh, gun related organizations in the immediate aftermath of that case. Uh, I think it was maybe I forget if it was after Heller or after McDonald. I forget. But I went to some cases where he w went to some gun rights groups where he appeared. And people would say, well, why didn't you argue about machine guns? Why didn't you talk about the machine guns? And I'm thinking to myself, you all are fucking idiots. You you have no fucking clue. <laughs> it's like, we're trying to get the right to have a handgun in the home at all. And you want Alan Gura to argue about machine guns. Are you fucking insane? It's like we don't have the back that we don't have it. Well, why well, should have the right to machine gun? I'm like, maybe we should. Or well, you should argue about that. I'm like, I fucking hate you. And, and 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 it was great because maybe maybe I'm reading too much into it. You know, maybe I was I was well, I was watching Alan Gura as he would get these questions. 
about the machine guns, right? And I thought, at least, I could see the wheels in his head turn. Like, how do I answer this question without making this guy seem like a complete idiot? <laughs> you know, that's what he was thinking. Or at least that's what I thought he was thinking. It's like, yeah, you know, that's not going to fly. It was a 5-4 decision, guys. Really? You want me to go out there with machine guns? How do you think that's going to end? You guys are idiots. You know, I had enough trouble getting as much as I did for the day, and now I have a precedent we can build on. You know, Alan Gurr is not an idiot. He realizes, you know, a precedent we can build on is better than a precedent against us. So, you know, and the, what's frustrating, of course, is the Supreme Court has not taken the opportunity to build on that precedent, which says even more that Alan Gurr was right. You know, not, apparently he got as much as he could possibly get and as much as he could possibly get for 10 years. So, you know, apparently Alan Gurr was completely right, even though, you know, the real pro-gun people like machine guns for life or nothing else, liberty or death. I'm like, you guys, you're all morons. I just think it's easier when you look at anybody that's pro-gun with 2A to kind of take things to an extreme and invoke fear. People are scared of an inanimate object. Guns don't kill people. It's the people that do. And, and the reality is making something illegal isn't fixing it because murder is all rare. Uh-oh, we lost Stephanie. It's very sad. I'm sure Stephanie will come back to us. So we'll wait for Stephanie. I am sorry we lost her. She'll come back. <laughs> oh, there she is. She's come back. Hold on, I have to add her back to the thing. There you she is. Hooray. Rude. Rude. Hey, it wasn't me. Rude. It wasn't me. But no... In general, like I said, they make themselves look silly, and it's something they don't understand, and it's easier to weaponize. You know, free speech, yes, you can weaponize, and yes, you can say things that hurt people's feelings, but you're not putting up pictures of, of kids that are dead. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're going to sway some people. And the fact that they, in places like Japan, where there is extremely stringent firearm laws, it doesn't stop mass anything they just go stab everybody or, or it doesn't stop what you're trying to so disarming the good doesn't eliminate the bad mm -hmm. and i think that's where we fall into the trap it's just easier to try to discount because oh but it'll keep everyone else safe no it won't stop being ridiculous yeah. I'm, I'm, I am, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful we'll get a good opinion out of the Supreme Court. It's going to be five, four, or six, three. I, I would not be surprised at all if Roberts winds up on the other side of this thing, and it's a five, four with Roberts joining the, the liberal minority, because that seems to be the way Roberts is rolling. Roberts has been a disappointment, <laughs> and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't anticipate on his vote. I, you know, am, in retrospect, I'm amazed we got his vote the first time. So, yeah, we're looking at a 6-3, decision that's going to say probably something. If I had to guess, I'm going to think what I think it's going to say is there's a right to, to bear arms outside the home. And the government can put restrictions and licensing on that, but they can't arbitrarily deny it to people. And they can put terms and conditions on it in terms of. For example, banning people from carrying it into sensitive places, carrying carrying over language from Heller and McDonald about that. But I think you're looking for a decision that says there's generally there is a right to keep there's a right to bear. I think you are looking for the state can choose the means. So open or concealed carry, they can pick one. Either one will be fine. Um and they have to make it available to everyone generally, and they can impose some sort of licensing scheme and some sort of qualification scheme and some sort of thing, but they have to make it generally available and they can put restrictions on it. And that's kind of the opinion you're looking for in a six to three opinion. You know, you're looking for something that's fairly generic and fairly limited because it doesn't look like the Supreme Court's willing to go much beyond that. Which, you know, fair if, if that's what we get, it would still be an improvement. There's at least 
a couple states even today that are no carry for concealed carry or open carry for that matter. So it would be an improvement in, you know, 10 states or 12 states or something. And it would be something that, you know, you can build on another day, you know, one piece at a time. Yeah, but you also have to look at the, I refer to it as the Pennsylvania hedgehog law. You know, Pennsylvania, it was illegal to own hedgehogs. Now it's legal again, but you can't bring them into the state, nor can you breed them. But it's now legal. And that's, I think, where you run into the same thing with some of the, you know, some of the permits that you have, you know, oh yeah, yeah, you, you can you can get a permit, uh, pay this amount of money and put this many articles in the newspaper and stand on your head and do a dance and we're still not gonna issue it. You compare to Pennsylvania, it's like 25 bucks in 20 minutes and you're good. Two questions from chat. Azeroth K says, then what's the alternative? We sulk and mew and ask pretty please to remove all rights. Can we please give me back an inch? Yes. That's the alternative mm -hmm. from Pretty a legal, much. from a, from a pragmatic legal standpoint, you know, read the room as they say, I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying that in my humble opinion, it's what we can get right now. So yes, pretty please. Can I have an inch back? Yeah. That's kind of the point we're at. Maybe it shouldn't be that way, but it is that way. And I think the evidence of the Supreme court, not taking cases, for 10 years, you know, and looking for opportunity to dump cases is pretty strong evidence of that. So pretty please may I have an inch? Yeah, that's the alternative. That's where we're at. So yeah, pretty much. And then um, watching daily says, I think they'll make it shall issue and remove may issue. That's basically what I was trying to say in so many words. Yeah, they'll take away may issue and say you shall issue. Now what you shall issue is either open carry or concealed carry you can pick and you can put inside some sort of training requirement you know background or background review you can put inside restrictions on sensitive places because that would echo the language of heller but yeah that's basically the decision you're looking for so yeah we're looking for an inch but an inch is better than what we came out with so you know what do you want you want a mile well it's not happening so take the inch you know, the only other alternative is you is you go for broke and you you lose a foot because the Supreme Court is much more likely. You know, you you go in with a too strong ask. You know, you'll you go back for, you know, I, I, I you got to You just got to read the room and what's possible. It's like, yeah, I mean, this is what's possible. What's possible right now is a decision that says shall issue concealed or open carry take your pick some sort of licensing some sort of background check restrictions on you know felons carrying restrictions on sensitive places blah blah etc that's that's what's possible yeah if it goes much beyond that you know i'll be surprised but you know i wouldn't expect it I don't know if you have anything to say about that. No, no. Let's continue before I get myself in trouble with you. You think that uh, you think the Supreme Court will give us more than that? I don't. I, I think you're giving them a little bit too much, a little, little too much credit there. They, they've been pretty wishy-washy when they shouldn't. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I was kind of giving the best possible case. This is as much as we can expect. Yeah, I, I don't think, I think best possible case, that's even a lot. No, I, I, you know, if anything, I will agree with you. I will agree with you that even that's a lot. I mean, the chat over here is like, can we get an inch? I'm like, yeah, this is the best possible case. This is kind of what we're looking at as the best possible case. If it's narrower than that, wouldn't shock me. If it's broader than that, shut the shit up, me. It's like, this is as much as we can look for. I'm like, this is this is as much as we can get. I'm like, yeah, maybe it shouldn't be that way, but it's yeah. where we are. And and Roberts, yeah, I, I wouldn't depend on Roberts necessarily. And for that matter, I wouldn't necessarily depend on, um, you know, Kavanaugh necessarily. Um, 
yeah, I, I think you got Barrett, Thomas, Alito. Um, not so sure about Kavanaugh. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we're in for a rough one with it. When someone in New York City is prosecuted for exercising their right to keep and bear arms, either at home or outside, they're almost always charged with second-degree criminal possession of a weapon, a violent felony. Mere possession. Mere possession. Mm -hmm. is violence. Okay. Three and a half to 15 years. That statute criminalizes possessing a loaded firearm outside the home or possessing a loaded firearm anywhere with the intent to use it unlawfully. Which, you know, New York is pretty broad. It's a more severe charge than possession of an unloaded firearm, which is a lower non-violent felony, but one will take note. A felony. Merely possession of an unloaded firearm. Okay. Second degree criminal possession of a weapon applies to virtually all people, both outside and inside, because of broad provisions within the penal law. The penal law considers a firearm loaded if a person possesses it at the same time they possess ammo. Regardless of whether in fact it is loaded, well, there's something I didn't know about uh, about New York specific law. There's something I've learned about New York specific law. Now, the I do know that a lot of places will consider it loaded if a magazine with ammo is in the firearm, regardless of one if one is in the chamber or not. So I know that, like the, the magazine is in the gun, it has loaded ammo, regardless of whether one is in the chamber or not. That's considered loaded. It's but actually I did... considered loaded in many places, even if the magazine's empty. Yeah, apparently in, New... apparently in New York, if you merely possess the ammo, even if you don't have it in the gun, the gun is loaded. This, to right, me, is a, str a strange definition of loaded. But that's what I'm saying. That's It falls into the same why when you check a firearm, you can't have a magazine in the firearm, unloaded or not they consider it a loaded weapon as soon as the magazine's installed. So you have to have them separate, regardless of if you have any bullets in it or not, because to them that's loaded, which is oh. dumb, but throw a phone at someone, it'll do just as much damage at that point. And they cite People v. Gordon, finding it legally irrelevant whether cartridges were in the firearm at the time. <laughs> It's legally irrelevant whether or not there are bullets in the firearm in order to determine whether or not the firearm is loaded. Outstanding. <laughs> okay. Okay. As a result, New York prosecutors rarely charge firearm possession as a lower level offense, alleging unloaded. The penal law dictates that unlicensed possession of a firearm is on its own presumptive evidence of intent to use it unlawfully. Okay. Well, that solves, that saves a lot of time. That saves a lot of time. Merely because you possess the loaded firearm, which I will remind you, is loaded because you have ammo somewhere in the proximity of the gun. That also provides a presumption you intend to use it in violation of another law. New York, New York, New York may not be Second Amendment friendly, Stephanie. I'm getting some vibes. I, uh, you could not pay me to live there because of firearms laws. You live in a state adjacent to it. No, nah, not most of the time. I'm only I'm only here part of the time in a state adjacent. And the state I'm in, thank you very much, now allows me to hunt with a 50 caliber during hunting season. So we're golden. As a result, unlicensed possession on its own is legally sufficient evidence to establish heightened violent felony of second degree criminal possession. Together, these two provisions allow New York prosecutors to charge almost every firearm possession as a violent felony of second-degree criminal possession. And then they have a footnote. In addition, because unlicensed possession alone is legally sufficient to establish unlawful intent, the home exemption 
contained within the text is rendered academic. Every possession case at least qualifies for second degree criminal possession, even in the home. So, Stephanie, Stephanie, it appears in the great state of New York, the Empire State, the home is not special. Wait, you need to like go put on some pearls to clutch since I know that's like your favorite statement of all time. I'm sad. I think you talked about having merch that said that. Do you need to do you need a minute? I mean New York State's not respecting the home, yo. Well, I I don't know what to tell you. It's apparently not as special as you'd like to think it is. <laughs> I'm not surprised by anything New York does at this point. <laughs> you just look at New York and you're like, why? No, enough. Like, how? Darwin, somebody, please. <sighs> is the defense if one has a firearm license, but securing this license is no easy feat, especially those for an indigent, I imagine. <laughs> For example, the NYPD maintains control of firearms licensing in New York. It requires applicants to submit over $400 in fees, pricing out indigent people. Yeah. Um, how much fees do you have to pay in order to exercise your First Amendment rights? I can't remember. It administers, adjudicates on its own. Moral character of applicants. And it retains ultimate and broad discretion in granting who to deny and affirm. And then they go into the history of this in 1911. In terms of, in terms of the uh, law, and the New York police chief at the time said the following in 1911. Another thing we consider essential to the safety of the upstate residents is to prevent the workmen, that would be, you know, the average, everyday people, from carrying concealed weapon. This is a strong habit with both, can I say this word without getting in trouble? Um, you should be able to. Strong I, habit. You know what, just, just don't. Fine. <laughs> It's a strong habit with black people and Italians. Yeah. <sighs> Racial fear continued to drive New York Firearms Regulation Scheme. Particularly glaring in movements calling for racial equality when New York can currently implement increasing firearm restrictions at the same time. What a weird coincidence. At the same time, people are calling for racial equality. New York is saying not so much for black people. Oh. In 1967, major, fi major firearms retailers in 1967, such as Sears, suspended sales of firearms in racially troubled neighborhoods, a policy that the then mayor attempted to codify into law. So, redlining with firearms. This is the proud history that New York State wishes to preserve in its legacy. Can we just like give them back? You want to give them back to England? I'm, well, but I'm just saying, people say like, oh, hey, let's give back California to they can be their own can, can we just jersey new york can, can you can go go play by yourself too yeah well i i do appreciate this is professionally written and i appreciate the boldness in which it's written they're not pulling any punches making their opinion well 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 noted i'm slightly amazed that they were able to get a consensus on this language from the people they're representing you know that they were able to get this through 
as it's bold and direct. You're not really pulling any punches. It's not mean. It's just clear. But it's it's bold. So, you know. I mean, fortune favors the bold, but I'm not so sure in this case. Well, what's interesting is it's one of like 43 briefs, as I mentioned. I think the vast majority of them have been filed for the petitioner. Um, let me see if I can determine in terms of who it's been filed for, because yeah, the vast majority I think has been filed for the petitioner. So a lot of people are coming defense of New York State and Pistol Rifle Association. So I'll just give you a list of all the organizations that are filing and what they're filing for. How about that? Sure. That'd be a good way to go. So let me just look it up real fast. Just have to pull it up from the docket, so give me a second. Come on. That's what I want. All right, so here are the briefs that have been filed so far. Okay. Alabama Center for Law and Liberty. Professors of Second Amendment Law. I want to be part of that group. That'd be badass. I want to be a professor of Second Amendment Law. Claremont Institute Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence. Bay Colony Weapons Collectors. Association. Yeah, the Bay Colony Weapon Collectors have an opinion. The Association of New Jersey Rifle and Pistol Clubs, the Italiano American Jurist and Attorneys, National African American Gun Associates, Mountain State Legal Foundation Center to Keep and Bear Arms, George Young, I don't know who that is, Buckeye Institute, I know who they are, Representative Claudia Tenney and 175 additional members of the U.S. House, Law Enforcement Groups and States and Local Firearms Rights Group. Citizens Committee for Right to Keep and Bear Arms. That's Island Gottlieb's group. Good group. That's us. That's the Second Amendment for our Foundation's uh, sister group. Good group. DC Project Foundation, Operation Blazing Sword. Pink Pistols. That's okay. the gay group. That's the gay group. I, I love Pink Pistols. That's, the, that's the, the group for the gays who want to have guns. They're great. I love Pink Pistols very much. Jews for Preservation of Firearms Ownership, Patrick Charles, J. Joe At Asia, Second Amendment Foundation, America for Constitutional Rights Union, Cato Institute, respect, Firearms Policy Coalition and Professor Joyce Lee Malcolm, American Center for Law and Justice, NRA Civil Rights Defense Fund, respect. We could go through that a little bit if you want to see what the NRA had to say. California Gun Rights Foundation, California Rights and Pistol, Rifle and Pistol Association, William English and Center for Human Liberty, Center for Defense of Free Enterprise, National Foundation for Gun Rights and National Association for Gun Rights, which apparently are two different things, the Foundation and Association, Independence Institute, Ted Cruz et al. Ted Cruz filed a brief with uh, looks like about 20 people, give or take. The Madison Society, Asian Pacific American Gun Owners, Governor Greg Abbott. What did Greg Abbott have to say? I don't know, but this literally sounds like if you're reading through someone's like fantasy football league of weird ass team names. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most random, like, you don't need to. Let's just Second Amendment up. Law Professors, the FPC American Victory Fund. The League for Sportsmen, Law Enforcement, and Defense, Gun Owners of America, Gun Owners Foundation, and Heller Foundation, the State of Arizona, 
Professors Robert Leader and Na Nelson Lund. Nelson Lund is a heavy hitter. Respect. Buckeye Farms Association. Goldwater Institute, Rutherford Institute, National Sports Shooting Federation, the Liberal Gun Club, Black Guns Matter, Independent Women's Law Center. Do any of these briefs get your uh, attention? Some of them do, although I, I am slightly... <laughs> I'm slightly surprised that, like, Ayub's LFI doesn't have one in there. Well, they might not have filed one yet. I mean, you know, there's still time. But, yeah, this has been fi This has all been filed since July 9th. This has all been filed in less than 20 days. So, yeah. I, I, I kind of want to see what Ted Cruz, what brilliance had to come out of that one personally. But, hey. We can pull up Ted Cruz, Bruce. We can do a Ted Cruz. Tennessee has no permit for concealed as of July 1st. Ooh. Yes, and uh, Texas will have no permit as of September 1st, I think it is. So, yeah, also there. But I didn't know about Tennessee. That's pretty awesome. Alaska doesn't have. Yeah, Alaska is one of the OGs. They were, uh, I think they were one of the originals along with Vermont. Because they were they were one of the states that you had still it. Don't need one in Vermont. They were one of the states before uh, Florida, so it was Alaska, Vermont. I think Washington, and what was the fourth? I don't remember. But I remember three. The four of Florida had a fairly generous concealed carry laws. Brief of Ted Cruz and 24 other senators. <laughs> Bet you AOC's not on there. Well, that would be hard since she's not a senator. I just mean in general. We're not going to find AOC on any of this. Oh, she might follow a brief yet. We'll see. After she gets in trouble for parking her Prius behind the Whole Foods again, right? Okay. Let's see what Ted Cruz has to say. So it's uh, Ted Cruz, McConnell... John Bariso, Marsha Blackburn, John Boozman, Mike Brown, John Corrin, Tom Cotton, Kevin Kramer, Mike Crapo, Steve Gaines, Josh Howey, nice, John Hoven, Cindy Hyde-Smith, Jim Inovov, Ron Johnson, James Lankford, Michael Lee, who would make a fairly decent Supreme Court justice, in my opinion, Cynthia Lumens, Roger Marshall, Jerry Moran, Jim Raish, Marco Rubio, Nice to see him on there. Rick Scott and Tom Tillis. The inclusion of the individual right in the Constitution reflects Framer's determination not only the benefits of the guarantee the right outweighs the cost. Right. But no future legislation, including Congress, should have the ability to second-guess that determination. Yeah, that is kind of the point in codifying something in the Constitution. It's not supposed to be modified by mere legislation because it's supposed to re re represent something that's more fundamental than that, you know? Regulation is beat by statute. Statutes beat by constitution. Hierarchies of law. Yeah. Court of Appeals nevertheless balanced the constitutional right to keep and bear arms against legislative asserted interests if the two were comparable. They are not. Love it. As a right guaranteed to the people, any person within its ambit may exercise the right without permission, justification, or defense. You know, much like any other right in the Constitution, might one might notice. Like, for example, the First Amendment, or the Fourth Amendment, or, you know, the Fifth or Sixth Amendments, or really any of the amendments. So I, I, don't, I don't remember the, the, the part where I had to register in order to get Miranda. You know, and pay a fee. Visine. Make sure you get your Visine for your Miranda. Yes. Yes. When when you are reading your Miranda card and you are having those tough, difficult times, may on civil law and Stephanie recommend Visine. Visine will help you get that moisture in your eyes. 
and help you read that Miranda card that is so critically important to your rights. Don't go anywhere without Visine. It's as important as your right to a lawyer. Visine to get the red out. I mean, Astaroth, you can go with like the jerry can, but at that point I'd be like, just tank or truck, that's my canteen. If, if we're gonna go big, go big or go home. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go big or go home. What are we What are we wasting our time with? Nope, no, that's not what I wanted to do. That's better. Amici accordingly agree with petitioners the state of New York regulations on personal carry of arms violate the Second Amendment. Preach. They nevertheless write separately to emphasize that legislatures, whether in Albany or Washington, D.C., have neither power nor authority to second-guess policy judgments made by framers and enshrined in the Constitution. That is kind of the point for the entire Constitution. It is deliberately designed to set certain things outside of the scope of normal debate. And these days, all I have to say about that is thank God for that. Thank God for that. And I say that in particular, not even with respect to the Second Amendment, but the First. Because it seems to me that we are descending into increasing elements of tribalism. My side versus your side. And I've certainly felt that pressure, you know, as a conservative Republican YouTuber, when I have not defended necessarily Trump or Republicans. Because I I think that I have principles beyond the people that are involved and the people are not representing those principles, they're fair critique. But I certainly felt that, you know, um, pressure to just, you know, my team versus your team. And I see a lot of that and it might be my bias. Maybe it's maybe the problems are equally true on the left. But at least from my perspective, I see it a lot on the left where it's just, you know, my team versus all. And I see a lot of duplicity in thinking where they're not trying to maintain consistent thinking. They're trying to maintain a consistent political position regardless of ideological inconsistency. The team becomes more important than the idea. And it's, it's disturbing to me. First, I have to say that every time someone reads something about the keep and shove yet bear arms, I'm not sure why, but like my unintelligent brain goes to Family Guy and them walking around with literally like bear arms because Family Guy. I, I don't, I don't know. Every time, that's the first thing that goes through my head. Uh, but if you don't uphold everything that the conservatives or that the people that claim to be super conservative think, then you're not one of them. And I get that all the time. Yeah. Um, because, you know, oh my God, I'm, I'm conservative and Republican and that must mean, you know, that I don't, that I, that I hold beliefs that I don't. And it's because people aren't capable of thinking independently. That's what that is. It's like, it's one or all of it. You can't look at it logically. Five dollars from D. Patterson, who says, "Never believe your drying eyes." Thank you, D. Patterson, for the super chat. I mean, yeah, never those drying eyes. But yeah. No. I, yeah, the bare arms. We need to hang them on the shelf. Apparently, I, I just think that it's an all or nothing to it a seems lot of people, way. like in the, especially in the conservative space on YouTube. It's all or nothing. And if you break with anything, oh my God, you're a traitor. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it was interesting because I was like rewatching because I rewatch my content a lot to try to get tips for myself in terms of presentation and flow and how things are being presented. So I try to rewatch my stuff to try to learn something. I was rewatching some of my stuff from the uh, election fights you know, in the uh, the interim between the election and uh, the certification. And I was watching something where uh, at the time I was predicting how things were going to go when Texas sued a whole bunch of states for the election. I'm like, this isn't going to work. And a bunch of people in the comments were like, well, Robert Barnes thinks it's going to go anywhere. We'll see how it goes. I'm like, 
I'm like, you know, I just try to call things like I see them. It doesn't make any sense. And, uh, you know, I wound up being right, which made me feel validated. That's not the first time I've had one over on Robert. Um, but, yeah, it's like I just try to look at the things from an intellectual framework. There are great conservative thinkers. And there are reasons to believe in a conservative ideology. And, you know, there are modern thinkers that are really good, too. Uh, Thomas Sowell might be my favorite modern thinker, economics. But still, I, I really like what he writes. Um, and if you're going to go to an ideology, then you should say, well, to your own side, if it's true to that ideology. Same thing even with gun rights issues, right? You know, I've... I've long taken the position that, and this has been an issue of consternation with some in chat, the Second Amendment is properly viewed the same as the First Amendment, which might necessarily mean that it's at least discussable that some arms might not be within the right to keep and bear arms. In the same way that, you know, defamation is not within the right of speech. You say we have a freedom of speech, but that's never included defamation, even though you might say it. So if speech has never included defamation, maybe the right to keep and bear arms categorically excludes on its own terms certain arms completely. It's at least possible from a historical perspective. And then arms that are that are protected might be regulatable along the same lines of speech, which might, you know, have a whole scope of things. What? You're, good, you're waving good, yeah. at me. No, I was waving it at, at small. Okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, but I try to analyze this an honestly. You know, I try to, and, and my opinion isn't necessarily the end-all, be-all. You know, just because I'm saying it doesn't mean I'm right. I'm not God. You know, I'm trying to assess the history as best I can to come up with an honest opinion, which, you know, there are other people who could look at it and come up with different honest opinions. Um but I do get frustrated from time to time when I'm like, you know, I'm like, well, maybe the Second Amendment has some restrictions. And like, he then, you know, it's like, I'm pro Second Amendment, guys. I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm on your side. That doesn't mean I necessarily have to take it to the absolute law where everything is protected. Absolutely. It's like, you know, it's, I, I don't think it quite means that. That's usually me that you're arguing with, but okay. That's usually me that you're arguing with about firearms and things thank you very much i feel attacked now uh but i have to i do have to answer uh somebody's repeated question i've seen uh why less bear well, you have opinion on this? i don't have so, any particular somebody opinion somebody several times keeps calling me out and asking why i'm a less bear person do you have an opinion i don't have any particular that? opinion i think he does fine work he's he's a he's competent he's good i don't have any strong opinion about him i i th i approve of him generally but i don't have a strong opinion Okay. I mean, is there, you don't prefer Les Bear, or Ed Brown, any of them? I don't know their work good enough to have a strong opinion with it, to be quite honest. I, I know they do good work. I know that they're competent in their field, that some people really prefer their, their, their work that they do. And, you know, I just don't, I don't, ha I don't know them well enough to have a strong opinion about them. But they're, they seem to be good from everything I can tell. Yes, Cobra, it was you. Uh, now, to answer the question, since I've seen it pop up repeatedly, uh, why am I a less bear person? Because he makes impeccable firearms. Um, he's not... Some people that hold themselves out to be custom firearms are not. He machines his... It's pronounced less bear. He is, you know, not saying oh i'm doing this custom but then he's essentially using machined blanks uh, he fits everything they have amazing customer service they have some really unique stuff and i also competed using theirs so i'm a less bear person ed brown's okay i'm not a wilson combat custom person so they wilson combat does good work too from what i understand I, i'm just not a personal it's just not my cup of tea and if i'm paying six thousand dollars for a gun yeah no fair completely fair you know you you gotta have uh you gotta have um 
you know, your own preferences. Hmm. What? But back to but back to this. But I mean, where do you see this going? Well, I I've tried to give my best opinion about. Uh, oh, while we're on the subject, what do you think of Terran Tactical? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to look for the name. Um, yeah, where I see it going is I, I think, well, what I said earlier is the best we can hope for. And it's a realistic perspective, but, you know, whether or not we'll get that much, we'll see. Um, I wouldn't depend on Kavanaugh. I certainly wouldn't depend on Roberts, who is a bit of a disappointment. I've often said that I prefer Kagan at this point to be Chief Justice than Roberts. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I want Amy Coney Barrett. <laughs> I don't know if she's the right temperament to be Chief. I think Kagan could do it. I'm, I don't know, but I don't know Barrett well enough. She's not been on the bench as long as Kagan. So maybe. It, so the 6,000 was not because of aimbot. It was because it's a high capacity 1911 and 40 that was a limited edition. So over the three, but uh, yeah. No, I, I, ACB, how she, at her hearings, I mean, she, how she held herself told me a lot. And, and that's why I really think that she would very much be like, no, we're not playing this game. Just no, all the no. Yeah, I mean, that's how, kind of how I feel about it, to be honest. Well, I think that pro probably wraps things up for tonight. I think we've covered the briefs that we wanted to cover and had a good discussion mm -hmm. on firearms and a good discussion on stuff. You know, I, I will, I'll just sort of end with a prior note that I had. You know, the, the, best, the best firearm is the one that you will use and be familiar with. I think that's got to be the end point of the analysis. You know, it doesn't really matter if a 45 is better than a 9mm. It doesn't really depend matter if a revolver is better than a semi-automatic. It doesn't really matter if a rifle or shotgun is better for home defense than a handgun. None of it really matters at the end of the day. What really matters at the end of the day is that something that you will be comfortable with and will practice with and will have training and familiarity with because when everything goes to shit you're not going to have any time to think and you definitely want to be familiar with the tool it's just a tool it's only a tool and the tool can only be as valuable as you have familiarity with it when it comes to a moment of crisis and you know the best firearm for you is a Ruger 22 then you know it's better than the 45 you'll never use or better than you know an ar-15 or better than anything else and stephanie also had a really good point there are a lot of ranges that will rent you a firearm for and you can usually choose between different firearms you know for the day you know you can rent firearms at a set price and you can switch between them so go to a range try them out go a second time try them out again find something that fits well in your hand find something that's familiar to you find something that feels good find something the weight is good consider what you need to use it for will you be carrying it concealed if you're carrying it sealed consider its weight consider its thickness consider how it might print on what you're carrying it in you know but you know, be familiar with your firearm that's really all i have to say in conclusion do you have any thoughts in conclusion? I think I'll, I will give my, you know, yeah, be familiar with your firearm, but also be familiar with your own abilities. Mm -hmm. If you don't truly have it in you to take a life and pull it out and use it, you have no business owning it. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to be honest with yourself, not just 
with can I can I handle the recoil? When the time comes, are you going to be able to stand up and use it? Or are you going to freeze and be scared to? Know your rights, know what to say, which, you know, lawyer, 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 <laughs> don't run yourself into the ground and, and know your rights, maintain them, maintain your firearm so it works when it needs to. And that when it counts, you can use it. That's the most important. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, that's all. That's all right. You know, it's just well, it's it's a tool. It's a tool, and you've got to understand its limitations, and got to understand how you can use it and when, and go from there. So I think it's absolutely correct. So this will be, you know, posted on Friday, and I want to thank yeah. my guest Stephanie as always. So we're going to try to do firearms Friday. So we're going to try to do a weekly recording talking about firearms, plenty of firearms, a lot to go around. So let us know what stories and firearms related stories you want to cover. If there's self-defense stories you want us to cover, you know, armed citizen stories you want us to cover, legal stories, cases that you want us to cover, anything firearms related, um, you know, new firearms that are coming out, we could review on a technical level. That might be fun. So stuff that you want us to cover, let us know in the comments and we'll go from there. I've been on Civil Law. My guest has been Stephanie, who is very cute. I hope everyone has a great day. Until later, my friends. Cheers and goodbye. Cheers.